know, you know, the idea that kind of you know developing sort of uh, economies like Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine can join on the same benefits as the uh, existing EU membership is is clearly uh, not true. You know, um, uh, so you know, stick with an FTA. You know, have really really good trading relationships, build up those trading relationships, try and increase or reduce the kind of imbalance in that trade, you know, create space to kind of build up your services and, and so on. But, but you know, the, the actual wider benefits are not really kind of proven to me. Plus, you know, all this stuff around sanctions alignment and now the EU wants to open its own spy agency and all these kind of things. Well, you say, well, actually, you know, is not what they want to sign up for? I don't know. So. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again to Ian Proud. Ian was a British diplomat from 1999 until 2023. He worked in Thailand, Afghanistan, and Russia. And about the last posting, we already did an episode. Um, I will link that in the description and add also a link to his most recent book that he wrote called A Misfit in Moscow, How British Diplomacy in Russia Failed. However, today we want to discuss an article that he wrote about the Georgian elections because Ian was also is working on uh, economic analysis and he is saying that Georgia in his article uh, the election was just as much about the economy and not just about uh, being with Russia or being with the West as it is often portrayed. So Ian, thank you very much for coming online today. It's nice to see you again, Pascal. Glad to be, good to be back. Good to have you back. So uh, your argument in this article is quite nice because you add a lot of data to argue that, look, the, the election, what came out is 53% or percent or so for the ruling Georgia Dream Party also had something to do with the economic development of Georgia. Could you please explain what you mean? Yes, yeah, so I mean Georgia is first and foremost quite a small sort of country, three point one million. It's not actually in Europe, but let's put that issue aside uh, for now. Uh, since twenty twelve, really, it's been so growing incredibly well. It seems to have had under the Georgia Dream Party. I'm not sort of saying I'm for them or against that party, but under their kind of leadership, there's been really impressive kind of economic growth strategy for the for the country that's averaged, you know, sort of six uh, percent economic growth a year, which includes actually the pandemic, you know, contraction on lots of their kind of key measures like poverty reduction, according to the World Bank, this is not, you know, according to Russian data, it's according to the World Bank, uh, they've made significant progress, they have brought unemployment down, so massive amounts of work to, to be done, obviously, to kind of level the gap between the, the wealthy kind of urban centres like Blisi and the very rural kind of areas of Georgia, actually, which voted for Georgia Dream. So predominantly uh, where poverty is, is is much higher. But this is a country that is actually kind of economically in a good uh, place, going in a good you know direction. Uh, there are no signs, after actually the war in Ukraine, we can perhaps do on that a bit, a bit later, that it's been kind of held, you know, held back. So that then raises the question, I suppose, you know, what are the benefits long term to Georgia from EU membership, from an economic perspective. Now, my view is that countries should trade with every country, like, you know, Georgia trading with the EU, you know, clearly makes sense if that works for Georgian exporters, if that works for EU exporters, and so on. I mean, that's a choice that, you know, Georgia should trade with everybody you know, that it possibly can. But in addition to trade, you know, what are the sort of wider benefits really to, um, to Georgia from EU membership? Well, when you look at the economic picture, actually, Georgia has, has actually lost out. You know, when you look at the data, you know, this is European data. This is not, you know, Russian data or, or anything else. This is credible kind of data data sources. Uh, you know, it, it, if if um, the EU is essentially kind of a trading lot, then the EU's advantages over Georgia have progressively increased since Georgia signed the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement in 2014 that was then implemented in you know, 2016. Yeah. So from a point where the EU exported three times as much to Georgia than it imported from Georgia, now it's it's almost um, uh, so six times 
more in, in some places in the EU exports to Georgia than, than, it, than it imports from Georgia. Germany exports 7.8 times more to Georgia than it imports you know, from Georgia. So this big trade imbalance has built up where EU exporters are uh, selling more to Georgia, you know, uh, but Georgian exporters aren't actually selling any more anymore to Europe, uh, which then raises the question, well, actually, that's that's a negative benefit. That's a disadvantage to Georgia from sort of closer, you know, ties with EU. Um, then you look at the investment picture. You know, investment hasn't really kind of massively changed from the EU into Georgia since the DCFT was signed. So it then raises the question: Well, economically, if Georgia isn't benefiting, arguably is losing out. You know, from its strengthened relationship with the EU, what are the benefits from EU membership? which then takes you into the whole kind of values agenda and that kind of stuff. It becomes much more about economics, which we thought sort of EU membership uh, for Georgia was about uh, something more ethereal, like values and and that sort of stuff, uh, you know, and other kind of troubling issues like, well, if if Georgia becomes a member of, of the EU, then, it, you know, we'd have to remind some of the sanctions against Russia and all these kind of very, very difficult things. Uh, so the, the economic case isn't really there or hasn't been proved yet. You know that, that Georgia is going to benefit from EU membership, uh, which you know I just pose a question. Well, you know what, with a kind of EU membership for Georgia, you know what are the real benefits to Georgia, a country which appears to be going in in a very good direction? You know, without that. So where is this trade imbalance coming from? Um, it does Georgia just not have enough local produce to actually sell or or local local in, in in industrial goods to sell to the eu or is the eu just not interested in what there is or are there actually roadblocks that keep certain things that georgia could export from going to from going to the eu well the the eu is is you know quite protective in you know, a trading body as as you know we all know and um since 2021 it has imposed 58 trade investigating uh, sort of procedures against Georgia. These are the sort of procedures which actually kind of restrict um, tariff-free benefits for certain goods imported from Georgia, limit access for, for certain Georgia goods coming in, in from Georgia. Uh, so, you know, the EU has, has, since 2021 at least, actively been putting in blockages to prevent certain Georgian goods being imported into, into the EU. Now, this has been cloaked under the umbrella of, well, you know, this is to to prevent you know EU um, Georgia acting as an intermediary sort of to, to bypass sanctions against Russia. But there's actually very little evidence to prove that. There's a very good Swiss study um, that actually said, well, actually no, that's just you know there's very little evidence to kind of underpin that sort of allegation. This is purely kind of EU protective trade measures against Georgia. So, and of course Georgia doesn't have the same you know protections against EU goods. So, you know, eight times you know, German sort of overmatch, you know, of, um, you know, it's, it's about six times more French goods uh, exported to Georgia than, than imported from Georgia. So there's just in Western Europe, the, the interesting thing for me was in Western European countries, you know, the big East, you know, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, you know, Poland. Um, that that's where the imbalance seems to be kind of biggest. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the really powerful sort of Western European countries seem to have advantaged uh, most. Um, you know, from the signing of the DCFTA, where uh, countries close in in the EU closer to you know Georgia haven't so much. They have a more balanced. I talk about the example of Bulgaria, for example, which I think is perhaps the only EU country where. It imports more from Georgia than it exports to Georgia. And I argue that's partly about geography because, you know, trade is largely about geography. People tend to trade with people that are you know, closer to them in general terms. It's easier, it costs less. And you see that with Bulgaria, which actually has a, has a trade deficit with Georgia. Um, but Western European countries, powerful Western European countries, you know, the ones where all the kind of EU institutions are, you know, Belgium as well, have benefited massively from this. And have been the ones involved in in putting in place restrictive measures against Georgian goods at the same time. Yeah, and I mean, in in a sense, this is also a very this is a very normal thing to happen. We've seen that with Ukraine too, right? Despite 
despite the entire we will support Ukraine, whatever it takes and and whatever you need, we'll give it to you. If Ukraine says we would like to export our grain without any tariffs and barriers to the EU, then the EU says, no, no, <laughs> no my oh, friend, no. No, not quite we that. will have high not barriers. Really. We will protect our markets. So, I mean, friendship ends very quickly once it comes to this trading issue. Now, what are, do you know what are the 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 Georgian sectors that, that the EU is actually very protective against, like try, uh, wouldn't want to immediately it, trade it as it, freely as it could. It's a lot. Um, it's, it's things like tin plate, it's, it's tableware, you know, plates and, and, that be, and it's, it's a very, very detailed list. I, I encourage you to look at it. There's no kind of one uh, board uh, sector. It tends to be uh, stuff that is sort of, you know, processed, uh, goods, you know, up to a certain uh, up to a certain point, uh, but it, it's quite a detailed uh, list. In in um, uh, agriculture, kind of less so, interestingly, but that that's another area where you know EU membership will be problematic for Georgia, mm-hmm. as uh, indeed, as you say, Ukraine has found because of its neighbours, Poland, Poland in particular, resistance to uh, cheap sort of uh, uh, um, Ukrainian agricultural products. So actually, if you look at Georgian exports generally, there is quite a mixed basket of things they do. It's all kind of middle range, kind of particularly high value sort of process products and and stuff. In addition to the, the exports of wine and the exports of of precious uh, metals and the exports of of agricultural goods, and it tends to be that kind of middle area where there are lots of kind of measures because they think they've come from China or they think they come from Russia and, and that kind of uh, political stuff. But what that does, of course, is it generally has a dampening effect, you know on exporting because exporters see that actually it's all the bureaucracy that you have to go through to get anything exported to the eu makes a lot of exporters think well actually of course maybe it's just too difficult to, and <laughs> we, we, we won't even try now how how then how, where's the six percent growth figure coming from so is trade with russia and with with other partners actually currently more beneficial for georgia um uh, the growth is is has largely been ex, um, investment led in georgia actually and that's not necessarily foreign direct investment led it's domestic investment led you know investments are very much driven by uh, government policies and um georgia is also a country with kind of high uh you know private consumption you know that's you know people like to kind of earn the money and like spend the money you know it's like the opposite of china right where where people like to earn the money and like to save the money. Well, you know, so Georgia in some spaces like Russia, people you know tend to be have a higher propensity to spend their money. So so spending, you know, private uh, sort of consumption and domestic investment are the two kind of key drivers uh, of growth in Georgia. Um they get good service ex- uh, exports as well, which helps on the trade kind of balance side because Georgia's a fabulously beautiful sort of country, you know, if you visit it. Uh, they get you know the tourism industry there uh you know so that generates kind of income as well but it's largely kind of investment and private consumption driven uh, growth in georgia it's it's not really because of external factors necessarily i mean georgia has a trade deficit it, it, even despite its advantages and services it can consistently runs a kind of uh, in a current account um, deficit you know for example it it does get foreign investment not so massively high levels of the foreign domestic investment um so yeah it, it's largely kind of domestic factors which have driven its growth trajectory so do you interpret the um the the victory of um georgian dream then also basically as a as a, a, a part of the georgian population saying look we should continue this economic route of trading with everyone without trying to integrate completely in one or the other block. Um, because the EU, of course, has great benefits, but those come at at a cost. And you're from a country, you're from a country that officially said we don't want to have that cost anymore and left. And I'm cost from a country <laughs> that that's that said we don't want the cost we never joined, right? Um, <laughs> so certain countries just decide that the EU itself, despite it being a very important partner, is just not the thing to to integrate into for the best way forward. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I think for average uh 
in the big list of uh, Georgian people outside of convey metropolitan urban uh, centres, you know, that they, they kind of do question what it's all, all about. And they see a country that's actually kind of generally going in a positive direction. It still has a lot of kind of work to do. Um, and I don't think, you know, the argument has necessarily been made out anyway in detail on the economic sort of benefits of membership. I mean, uh, if you see all of the press, Western press reporting, pretty much all of the Western, you know, reporting about the election, it's all in very high levels of generality, just like it was in Ukraine. You know, like, oh, this is our EU, you know, European choice and, you know, we're going to benefit so much. But nobody's really explaining what these benefits you know, will be, they're just kind of crafting it in a very kind of high level visionary way that actually, you know, will be so much better off. But but people have yet to kind of really be convinced of that. I think that, you know, they see the countries maybe not, you know, maybe George Dream isn't the best in the world, but I mean, against a very fragmented opposition, it's, you know, the better alternative available and the country is kind of going in the right direction. So we'll stick with that. And when we... Talk about this this economic setup as well. Then, what what do you think is the comparative advantage of of Georgia? Also, looking at its at its geographical position, um, whom it can trade with, because like as you said, like Georgia, like geographically, geographically is just outside what is considered the European continent. Although I must say, I find this weird. Like this is Eurasia is the only continent that we that we that we split apart based on some very <laughs> artificial kind of boundary. Um, anyhow, like leaving that I one agree. aside. I agree. I agree. But but it is but it is to the east of Turkey, which the EU is very clear. You know, it seems to me that. It will probably never join. So there's also that geography issue to kind of deal with as well. Um, but yes, no, you might. So, but but it has a neighborhood, right? It has. Uh, it's part of the Southern Caucasus. It's it can tr it can trade with the Northern Caucasus, which would then be like, of course, which are Russia. Um, Iran is a is a very close by neighbor. Um, what are the what are the opportunities actually um, for Georgia to to trade with its neighbors? Well, actually, Georgia, you know, has its arguably its best trading relationship with Armenia and Azerbaijan, with both of whom it has, I believe, a, a trading surplus. It kind of exports more to those countries than it imports from those countries. It actually has a disadvantageous uh, relationship with Turkey, which massively overmatched it in terms of Turkish exports against kind of Georgian imports. But certainly, with uh, Southern Caucasus a country, very advantageous kind of trading relationship. Um, uh, there and with Russia, you know, it's, it has a deficit with Russia, but it also has significant exports to Russia. Uh, the energy relationship is obviously a very important relationship there, you know, too. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it within its neighborhood, it, it sort of has kind of fair friends, um, are arguably more so than with the EU. If you look at if you look at Eurasia, Eurasian countries, you know, former Soviet countries, including Russia, India, China. You know, and actually Turkey, if you consider Turkey a Asian uh, yeah, country, if you compare the kind of disadvantage with EU trade, I think it's only, um, you know, two times um, uh, more, you know, uh, Eurasian countries export two times more to Georgia than the import from Georgia, which is kind of less than half of the disadvantage of, of actually trading with the EU. So then again, you see geography really kind of comes into play there that, you know, Georgia can have more advantageous kind of trade with the Eurasian countries compared to with the European Union. Uh, countries and you were uh correct me if i'm wrong you were in when you were in moscow you were the trade counselor right economic At, economic economic counselor so your job was literally to be the diplomat responsible to, for well trade negotiations right with with counterparts yeah. um like if you were doing the same job for georgia like in in partner states, what would you recommend to Georgian uh, e e e economic council er, councillors to how to approach these trade imbalances on a diplomatic level? What do you do in order to kind of reduce trade imbalance? Uh, well, I mean, there are some that you just can't, um, you know, reduce. Uh, of course, like the energy dependence is a big sort of cause of, of, of one of the imbalances there, of course, but. But folks are on its, you know, advantages, uh, some certain metals, agriculture, kind of wine, but but also actually, and this is something that, that Georgia is already doing, 
looking to develop its, uh, looking to move its economy up the value chain, because actually much of what Georgia exports um, at the moment is is fairly low on the value chain. Um, it's actually look kind of move up to kind of high and value added uh, production services and that sort of thing. Georgia seems to have an advantage advantage in services. You know, when you have a sort of talented, well educated you know, population, certainly in the urban centres, then service sector development is is a key area of growth because you know Georgia will struggle to have advantages in terms of the trading goods, uh, but in terms of the trading services, I think that, that's an area for for growth. But I think that's already actually in the Georgian government strategy that, that they recognise the need to kind of promote higher value adding you know, factors of production within society to have better, you know, sort of uh, more job opportunities for young university educated people. No personal employment in Georgia is very high still. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, if they can address that, then that will automatically kind of drive growth in the service sector, which will then help, you know, move Georgia into kind of a, a current account surplus territory rather than a sort of consistent a deficit territory that it's in at the, at the moment. Sorry, there's all very techy, but, but, but actually... Despite all of this, you know, Georgia managed, you know, because any country that obviously runs a, a deficit has a, you know, can end up with quite a big debt problem, you know, because when you import more than you export, you, you basically create sort of a big gap in terms of your foreign exchange reserves. You need capital to kind of pop that up. But actually, you know, Georgia is able to kind of maintain fairly healthy levels of debt through, again, its goods and macroeconomic economic management. Yeah. And of course, the, the problem the problem is then that you you need to import stuff from your partners in their currency which means you get need to get your hands on their currency and that's where the imbalance then comes from but is uh, how would you manage this because there are there are several ways of dealing with this issue as well i mean especially global south countries now are more open to the idea of also doing just currency swaps right in order to kind of get your domestic currency bag uh, and, 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 and you know, use more of domestic yeah. currency in order to pay for foreign goods. Is that a way forward in this more multipolar world now that Georgia can also look at countries like China and Russia and say, like, guys, uh, we want to continue to trade. And it, if we have a deficit, we have a deficit, but, but we need to do some currency swaps in order to make this possible. Yeah, and actually currency swaps could actually smooth the trading process too, right? You know, reduce the cost of that trade. So, yeah. Turkish lira, Russian ruble, Chinese yuan, you know, all these kind of currencies could be useful, uh, you know, and, and it's certainly it's sort of um, uh, Emirati dirhams as well as been rising up the kind of list of, of good trading currency, Indian rupees. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is worth, you know, looking at. I think that's going to very much create advantages at the margins of the trade. I mean, the, the script potential is, is by trading more, <laughs> yeah. ultimately. But these, these things can undoubtedly... You know, help when you kind of reduce reliance on euro trading and dollar trading. Of course, that that has to kind of be an advantage. And you know, Georgia has also been criticised for actually building a port project with China. Um, although the 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 kind of lawsuits that came out of that found that there's no there was no improper uh, uh, approach by by the government. Um, this kind of new relationship also with trading partners that are not traditional Georgian trading partners like China and and also engaging in services is that something that you would would encourage or are you more of the opinion that no stay within the region and try to develop more with the immediate neighbors uh, my, 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 my view is that countries should um, trade with any countries that it makes sense for them to trade with uh, investment is different because you know, geography is a less kind of critical factor in investment right uh, you know, mm-hmm. if investment is, is capital flows, you know, capital is kind of uh, cheaper to move around the continent than goods. <laughs> so, it, it's, and if you look at China, you know, in particular, China is a growing investment partner, you know, with Georgia for the reasons he set out port projects, Belt and Road, you know, projects and that and that sort of thing. It, it's less significant at the moment. It's a trading partner with, with Georgia, but so growing. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, trade with everybody, build investment partnerships. I mean, the, the growth area at the moment is in the global south and the BRICS world with what's happened on the back of the, you know, this evolution really we've seen in the Kazan summit recently, but this has been a sort of growing phenomenon that's really taken off, I think, in the past kind of three years. It's, 
greatest kind of greater kind of collective identity as Brits as an inclusive you know form for engagement but also economic cooperation so you know putting all of your eggs in, in the EU basket I mean you know feels to me too limiting because if you do that then you know you you basically subordinate your trade policy to you know the EU you can't have these kind of more open um uh you know relationships with blocks like you know Brits you know because the EU would prevent you from from doing that uh, so, yeah, as BRICS, you know, is now counts or soon will account for more than half of the world's population, then you know, that has to be a more lucrative long term strategic, you know, choice for, for Georgia to look at. And do smaller countries like Georgia actually have some leverage in negotiating um like better trade, a better trade balance? Uh, I had a discussion just last week with uh, Malta's, one of Malta's former foreign ministers and he told me the story how he went to Japan in the 1980s and told the Japanese look we are tiny but you have to buy more from us the trade imbalance is too huge we we demand that you buy more and he got them in the end to buy services from Malta uh, um, in the in like port infrastructure if I remember correctly but he went there as a diplomat and said guys you have to buy is this something that's still done these days that that you know in that that on a diplomatic level that you just go to the other partner and say like do something buy more from us and convince them to do so yeah i mean trade diplomacy is a key part of, of diplomatic activity right you're always at the encouraging sort of more trade deals more favorable trade deals so, so that's key but you know georgia is is a country of three million people against the eu block of what 500 million you know, people, there's a massive power imbalance there. And yes, of course, they can and they should, you know, try to do that. I'd say with Germany and France in particular, where the biggest trade imbalances, you know, kind of uh, lie, but but uh, recognising that actually they have limited power to, you know, to deliver big deals. And, and anyway, the, the big de ticket decisions that are taken in Brussels, right? There's always going to be horse trading, you know, the, the ultimate decision is whether the effort that Georgia would need to put into that will actually, you know, be worth any possible benefit they get out of it. So far, since the DCFT uh, was signed 10 years ago, the direction has been downwards and not upwards. <laughs> yeah, and, but you know, negotiations yeah, must have been happening, right? And yet this imbalance has grown. Wouldn't that actually be a reason for like Georgia's uh, foreign minister to go to the to Brussels and say like, okay, guys, look, we have this agreement and it hasn't been producing that much for us. Give us give us a better deal, um, like yeah, this, no, of this course. kind of trade diplomacy. Uh, of course, but my point is, surely they must have been doing that already. Right? Yeah, that's probably. Um, I don't know, but, uh, but yeah, no, of course. But I mean, uh, you know, let's see, you know, if they try and do that. But I mean. You know, joining the EU long term, yeah, why not? But I mean, I think actually in, in the short term, you know, given that it's going to be at least a decade, 15 years down the track in the short term, there's so much else happening in the world in a more vibrant kind of way around what's happening in the, in the global south that Georgia should also be looking at opportunities there as well. It would be sort of crazy not to do that. Of course. But I mean, also the experience of your country, of Great Britain and others, um, I mean, there are ways also for Switzerland to have an economic uh, setup with the European Union that does not that does not include you joining it. Um, the the question is one of, of the modalities, right? Um, let's say also like, you know, the European Union has a free trade agreement with Canada. And I think Canada is quite happy with with, uh, with that one. And uh, free trade agreements also allow for a lot of economic integration without joining a union. Um, what is in your, from your perspective, the ultimate, the 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 kind of most beneficial setup for a non-EU member to to um, to engage the European Union? Well, I would say for you know countries like Georgia. Probably longer term, the most beneficial setup is to kind of stick with some FTA arrangement uh, and not to go beyond that. Because beyond that, the, you know, the benefits are kind of if they're, if they're described as benefits, you know, the what's in the membership package is really more political than economic anyway. You know, if, if you've got a free trade agreement and you get membership, okay, you can get structural funds from the EU mm -hmm. if you do that. 
Um, you, you, you know, you're not going to join on the same terms as existing members of the EU, as we've seen with Ukraine, very visibly, this idea of a two-track, you know, Europe, the idea that kind of, um, you know, fairly kind of, um, um, you know, developing sort of uh, economies like Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine can join on the same benefits as the uh, existing EU membership is is clearly uh, not true you know um, uh, so you know stick with an FTA you know have really really good trading relationships build up those trading relationships try and increase or reduce the kind of imbalance in that trade you know create space to kind of build up your services and, and so on but but you know the, the actual wider benefits are not really kind of proven to me plus you know all this stuff on sanctions alignment and now the EU wants to open its own spy agency and all these kind of things. Well, you say, well, actually, you know, doesn't what they want to sign up for? I don't know. So. Um, did you also look a bit at um, how the how the new members of the EU, especially the ones that that joined last, um, kind of developed economically? Can we also like infer from their experiences? Um, I mean, Croatia, I think, is 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 actually doing very well in 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 the European Union. Although I have no I have no I have no numbers in my mind, but we have other members that are struggling. Like um, Romania and Bulgaria are not on the same economic level as the as the rest. And if you look at at the suffering that at the way that Greece, like suffered heavily actually from being uh, um, by the way it it was treated back in 2010 um, there are there are legitimate legitimate concerns also for for EU member states um, of how the center interacts with the periphery yeah exactly and a lot of it is about sort of imbalance in the kind of structure of the economies right I mean you've got countries like Germany and France these are very highly advanced you know economies and the problem with Greece was that Greece wasn't a, a very advanced economy and trying to kind of create sort of fiscal alignment, monetary policy alignment and that sort of stuff and, uh, between Greece and countries like Germany very obviously was going to fail, you know, because the costs on Greece of actually kind of bringing itself up to the same kind of uh, robust uh, macroeconomic, uh, you know, um, position as Germany was going to be too high <laughs> and that, and that's why it felt uh, and you know you look at uh, Romania and, and Bulgaria economically that they are nowhere near the level of economic development as Germany and, and France and it's not really in the interest of Germany and France to to enable them to to become like that so they they kind of sit at the periphery as you say um, and you know thank god they, they haven't decided to uh, sort of go much further in terms of sort of uh, monetary you know, integration, you know, than they have. But it's just it's just harder to sort of integrate when you are structurally different. You know, if you drive from Poland, as I have, you know, to Calais, uh, you know, Poland has done remarkably well out of EU integration. Poland looks like a sort of quite an advanced economy now, and it is. Uh, you know, into Berlin, it all looks like the same. You know, it's like economically. In terms of infrastructure, in terms of investment flow, service development, you know everything. You know each country has their has their kind of particular advantages, but it kind of looks and feels the same. And you can see why Poland has done well because it's done the investment. It's you know put itself up. If you go to Romania, it doesn't look the same. <laughs> and there's like a kind of very visual thing, right? That actually sort of a, it's hard when you're economically less prosperous to kind of join the EU because the other members are just economically so much more advanced than you are, and the co and the cost to you to get to where they are, are, are frankly just high, and in some cases can break you. Yeah, and that's why it makes more sense for for such economies to play on their strength, which is partially to have lower uh, lower uh, uh, costs for producing stuff, and that's then where it is so unfair that the first thing the EU does is say like, okay, no, we are not importing your cheap grain, we are not import, we are not, we are not accessing your cheap services because that would rival our uh, our local pro producers. But that's exactly where your competitive advantage is that you can <laughs> play on exactly. and you can export if you could, but then that's not what the big ones uh, will allow. But but it, and of course it's also around the structure of EU subsidies as well. Right? Mm. 
uh, yeah, I, I did a sort of a, a piece on, on on Ukraine recently on the back of um, Zikorsky's kind of pranked phone call, um, you know, a month or so ago. And, um, you know, take Ukraine and actually Georgia is, is pretty much in the same boat, but in, in a much kind of, you know, smaller way um, that you couldn't afford, you know, to give Ukraine the level of agricultural subsidies um, it gives, you know, other members of the EU. I mean, Ukrainian agriculture is just too good, uh, you know, in terms of size and in terms of output. Uh, and if if the EU were to sort of give Ukraine the same level, you know, in terms of size of population, in terms of agricultural kind of production and that sort of subsidies as existing members, it would take billions of subsidies off of existing members. Yeah. And existing members that say, well, actually, no thanks. Especially Poland. Uh, and also, for example, you know, and this it's, this applies equally to kind of Georgia as it does as it does to you know uh, Ukraine. You know, Poland gets more structural funds from the EU than any other country within the EU because it has such a big population that it gets you know huge you know more structural funds um, than any other country. You know, if Ukraine joined. Um, suddenly Poland would have to be putting money in to structural funds. They would have to be paying for less developed countries like Ukraine. They'd no longer be receiving an additional 6 billion euros a year. They'd be paying in billions <laughs> of euros. So the same thing applies to, you know, when you when you bring in some less economically developed countries, the EU has to pay, you know, if they come in on the same standards as everybody else, the EU has to pay the rich EU countries have to pay to kind of bring them up to a better level. And that is increasingly sustainable, unsustainable because if if all the countries that wanted to join the EU were advanced economies, it wouldn't be a problem, right? You know, uh, if Norway decided to join the EU, it wouldn't be a problem because Norway is an advanced economy. I know it's not going to happen, but if Switzerland, you know, I know Switzerland is uh, against the EU, but if Switzerland wanted to join the EU, this problem wouldn't arise, <laughs> you know. You wouldn't have to worry about agricultural subsidies or, or you know, sort of structural funds into Switzerland because Switzerland already has a lot of money. <laughs> if it's Ukraine and Georgia, they don't have a lot of money and you've got to pay, you know, you've got to subsidise them and pay structural funds and it just breaks the system. And that that is something that you just cannot overcome. And, and nobody talks about this, but, you know, it's it's one of the reasons why some people talk about a twin-track approach. And, of course... That's what Georgia is being offered in 10 or 15 or 20 years down the track, being a second class member of the club. Yeah, which is which is exactly why some people say like it would actually be it would be self-destructive for the EU to admit uh, Ukraine in a, on a fast track uh, just in order to to prove a point to Russia and kind of, you know, it's not going to do it. Would self, it would be self-destructive because you would, you would, you would create all of these imbalances mm. within the economy, the, the the local EU economy, that would probably create so much friction that yeah. you might have others who would just say, like, "No, I'm out. Um, I'm not going to yeah. do this." I mean, the UK was already left because it largely said we are not getting enough out of this. At least a, a good part of the population felt that you that the UK is at the shorter end of a of an imbalanced stick. Well, we, we were actually putting in, and, and in, indeed had always been net contributors to the EU budget. Yeah. We've always been the countries that have been subsidising countries like Poland. And that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm all in favour of that. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. But it is more on the kind of regulatory side where actually I think the issue is more that actually people in Brussels are deciding our rules in the UK. And I think it's really that that, that was a problem for the UK more necessarily than the economic cost because we've lost out in terms of agricultural subsidies, so, you know, some might argue, but I think it's more on the regulatory side. I think that's part of the, you know, that it moves it beyond the economics again, actually, what is the EU about? It's becoming, in terms of a regulatory perspective, you know, a sort of uh, almost like a super state, you know, uh, and that's, I don't really think that was the intention, you know, when people like Monet sort of set up the EU, is it really started as an economic kind of block, to promote freer trade and through that promote better neighbourly relations, you know, and a long term peace on the European continent, right? But I think the the regulatory side is the thing that ultimately will unpick it. 
with the von der Leyen very much a centralizer wanting the EU institutions to have more power, you know, and th these ridiculous bust ups she's having with Hungary at the moment, where people are actively ostracizing Hungary because Orban has a different view on foreign policy than than some of the other other members. And this is deeply unhelpful, uh, you know, for the EU longer term. And, you know, these kind of fissures where sort of increasingly nationalist kind of governments come into contact within uh, conflict with the EU institutions pose a real kind of strategic threat to the EU over the longer term. If it's just about the trade, then, you know, fine, but it's becoming so much more than about trade. Yeah. yeah, and this is, I think this is where smaller countries, also like Georgia and so on, need to need to really think about how to also negotiate their way with the EU um, while using the advantages of this new multipolar system and also say like, okay, we can we can buy or sell this to you or we can buy and sell to China. What are what are you offering? Um, I mean, this is yeah. one of the advantages of being outside the club, right? You have more you have more yeah. lateral freedom of action. Yeah, I mean, look at you know, countries like Singapore. I mean, they trade with everybody, uh, mm -hmm. and they don't need to be. I mean, obviously, the part of ASEAN, uh, you know, of course. Uh, but this is one of the most kind of vibrant, innovative, kind of prosperous, you know, uh, countries on earth. The, the United Arab Emirates, exactly the same. Um, you know, fantastically kind of dynamic places. You know, why do you have to kind of, you know? feel that you can only sort of be legitimate if you join some club of people who will never see you as an equal. <laughs> True. Um, yeah. True. The, the, and there are there are opportunities. And as you correctly said, Georgia already proved that it is actually prospering outside of yeah. the union. And why not just continue that route, which seems what exactly. the, what the decision is. It's doing was. incredibly well. I mean, it's doing incredibly well. A lot of, you know, Stuff needs to be done. Still, youth unemployment is way too high, um, but the trajectory is good. They recognise the need to kind of really build up their service sector, improve kind of uh, opportunities for sort of uh, people coming out of tertiary education uh, to get higher value adding jobs. I mean, they're all of these uh, and and these kind of improvements were actually uh, ironically going to held back by the Ukraine war, where suddenly there's this massive influx of you know hundreds of thousands of people from Russia, Ukraine and Belarus fleeing the war who are kind of um, digital nomads who were kind of crowding out sort of, uh, you know, young person employment uh, you know, in Georgia. So actually, ironically, the war was, was actually moved a, a massive st a setback for, you know, for Georgia, uh, a war that, of course, the European Union has been bankrolling. Yeah, absolutely true. And what the, the most important thing is to avoid a war yourself, right? I mean, you will prosper eventually as long as oh, you exactly. don't get your stuff uh, like yeah. blown up. Just have just have good relations with everybody. And well, why should it be, you know, let's choose Europe and not Russia? You know, why not Europe and Russia and you know, Iran and uh, Azerbaijan? And China and, and Iran and Turkey too. China yeah. and Turkey, you know, why not? I mean, what, why do you have to choose? Totally Are agree. You, you know, Totally agree. Um, we we are kind of reaching the time that we said we would we would use, but this is a this is a very useful talk again to also focus a little bit away from just the ideological stuff and 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 talk yeah. economics. Yeah, let's park the ideology and just focus on just buildings of multipolar kind of relationships uh, because that's the future of the world. You know, we, you know, picking and choosing. Focusing on values, you know, looking, you know, aligning too closely with political drives like sanctions and that sort of stuff. You know, for a tiny country of 3.1 million people like Georgia, that just poses risks, <laughs> frankly. Uh, you know, I mean, there you go. I mean, it, it is, 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 is the EU going to come to you know, Georgia's aid if, if uh, a war breaks out? I mean, it hasn't come to Ukraine's aid apart from selling money, but there you go. Weapons, weapons. They sent them the, the what they need in order to run toward the Russian bullets, um, no. which is to me the opposite of helping. But fine. Um, Ian, where can people find you if they want to read more from you? You publish on Responsible Statecraft. Where else? Yeah, uh, uh, Strategic Culture. I've got prouddiplomat.com. Uh, I'm on X as proud uh, underscore diplomat. Uh, so look me out in those places and buy my book because it's, it's really fascinating about sort of uh, 
you know, the, the mistakes that UK made in its relationship with Russia that ultimately led to this devastating war, which, you know, we should be trying our best to end as soon as possible. A misfit in Moscow, how British diplomacy in, in Russia failed. Everybody, I'll recommend that highly. Um, Ian Proud, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Pascal. All the best. Nice to see you again. 